I'm here just waiting for this, this stuff to end, and it's just, just taking its good old time. Yeah. All right, so this is now uh, the first inaugural episode of something new we're trying. Uh, it's a movie podcast. Uh, and this is called Off the Reel, and this is uh, the first episode. To those of you joining us, welcome, if there's anybody even watching this. And today we are looking at some movies, uh, doing some stuff. Uh, one question some people might have would be, uh, what, 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 what credentials do we have to really be giving an accurate analysis of uh, such theatrical pieces as uh, Problem Child 2 and... Uh, Tommy was those best friends, and that answer is uh, none, because we have no experience in this, and that's why it's going to be great. Yep. And today we're looking at a uh, very interesting movie. It's eleven years old now, and this is the uh, the first movie adaption, uh, the first live action movie adaption of the very popular graphic novel Blade, or I guess comic book and graphic novel, whatever the whatever format it was in. And yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about this movie. Uh, one of us is rewatching it right now. Uh, did you say eleven stay fresh. years old? Sorry, what'd you say? Did you say it's eleven years old? Uh, or no, sorry, no, it's not eleven years old. It's ten years old. Twenty. It's twenty years old. Oh, it's twenty years old. Yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ! You almost thought I was in two thousand eight for a second. How the times fucking fly. Yeah, dude. This movie came out in nineteen ninety eight. All right, well, yeah, isn't that just crazy? All right, well, I don't know if you guys have experience with the old series, but this is uh, this is an adaption. This is, of course, we're going to start this off by talking about goddamn superhero movie, but uh, a little bit of a different one. This guy is not the usual stuff you would see at the movie theaters nowadays making a billion dollars. This one didn't even really this make a huge amount of money. This was pretty fucking revolutionary. Yeah, because this was the first, like, uh, even though I'm not gonna get in this, this is like the first superhero movie using like someone who was like a vamp, like who was like a supernatural being, being a vampire, and it's also the first like superhero movie with a uh, African American lead, which is Wesley Snipes, who is currently under a Actually, mountain of debt. Oh, he's just, oh, who was the first again? Bond, but this was the first R-rated superhero movie. Uh, well, that's very interesting to know. And funny enough, this was also written by David S. Goyer. Who is best known as the writer for the um, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies? Makes a whole lot more sense now. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually really weird because yeah. he also wrote Batman versus Superman. Yeah. So yeah. All right. Well, let's give some uh, background about this. So basically, Blade. It's a uh, it's a comic book series um, based on the Marvel comics uh, of the same name. It's with uh, Wesley Snipes as the character named Blade. Uh, Stephen Dorff, I have no idea what else he's been in. He's the main villain, Deacon Frost, even though for some reason the comics have Deacon Frost being an older guy. This guy is uh, very much the equivalent of like that of a young like Patrick Bateman-esque millionaire in New York. And then also stars such stars as Chris Christopherson, Donald Logue, and I don't know how to say this properly, Nabushi Wright. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Like in Nabushi, Nabush. I think it's Nabush. Yeah. Is it Nabush? I think the e is supposed, yeah, I think the E is supposed to be silent. Oh boy, well, this is gonna yeah, be a, this is already a fun start. Yeah. So basically, this movie. So basically, let's start. Let's just go through the synopsis of what we're what we're looking at. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is going to be a fun first episode. So, basically, we have Blade. It starts off with, like, there's some back tasks about, uh, about the thing, how Blade was born. His mother, he was pregnant, uh, in the womb of his mother when she gets attacked by a vampire, and she apparently dies, but the baby is saved, and he basically becomes, like, half vampire, or, like, part vampire, and eventually will become... Kid. Can I get into the one thing here, though? What? In the movie, there has flashbacks. Like, um, whenever he go, whenever a future thing is, he has flashbacks of seeing his mother on there. And I'm like, how is this fucking possible? So he's like one second year old, and then they, and then 
it continues on and he has his like driver's license. And I'm like, I- I'm just picturing a baby blade, like five minutes. He was taken to the fraternity. As soon as the doctors all leave, it's like boss baby where it just gets up, starts running around, just grabs everything and then flies out the window. Well, literally it's vampire well, like, magic. They, and... they kind of explain that later. Ah. It's vampire uh, magic. You don't have to explain yeah. shit. No, well, they, they kind of, fucking Whistler kind of explains Blade's past a little bit and it kind of paints a picture of like what happened. But uh, keep going on with your synopsis. Yeah, I'm just kind of going from Wikipedia right now because it's pretty funny. So basically, uh, third, it's uh, now into what is the present day of this film in the 19, the late 1990s, and basically you have this guy and the girl. They're going off, and it's like, hey, yo, let's uh, let's uh, go uh, have some. F-. She's like, oh, let's go have some fun. He's like, yeah, I'm always up for surprises. Little does he know, he gets taken to a rave club where, uh, for some reason, he's like That's always like, yeah, I'm house. like, I'm like totally into this. And everyone else just hates his guts. And then he starts to realize that uh, he has gotten himself into a situation that he doesn't understand what the hell's going on. Because uh, in the middle of this rave, uh, what what looks like, was it like um, like fire, like water? What are, those, what are those fucking things called again? The, the sprinklers. Uh, sprinklers, basically. yeah. Like the sprinklers yeah. instead of spraying water um, during a fire, instead spray uh, human blood. And, it, and in the background, behind the DJ, it flashes for a second, and you blood see the bath. word bloodbath. Yeah. It's like, oh, could you be more on the nose, movie? Pretty much, yeah. And well, they weren't exactly hiding it when they show the dead bodies fly by. Uh, and then basically all of the people around him start to show off fangs of vampirism and basically uh, start to beat the shit out of him instead of actually trying to eat him. And then eventually he's covered in blood, uh, limping around, trying to get the hell out of there. And then suddenly the music stops, and in comes our protagonist, Blade, who uh, has a bunch of uh, guns and knives and shit that he does, and he basically murders the shit out of the rave people. And uh, just going into how they die, it's like... The freaking dying cool. animation looks like something you would see out of Windows Movie Maker. No, nah. like it's 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 bad. It's it's it is not. Honestly, a- I really didn't think that the CGI the or the fucking skeleton CGI was that bad. Because to me, when I saw when I was watching it, it it's not that bad. All it does well, or it, it's there long enough for you to get the point of what's happening, but it doesn't overstay its welcome until you get later on into the movie. I also sure. figured out where Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines got its death animation from. It's definitely this movie. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Oh, good Lord. Anyways, what happens is he basically he uh, he basically kills a bunch of the people in the club. Including this guy who's the uh, second, like basically the like right hand man for a vampire named Deacon Frost, who is the antagonist of the film. Basically, who wants to uh, become the blood god or some shit, basically. Yeah. And uh, basically, so he takes them out. The guy's on fire. He's burned to a crisp. Please come uh, and take this guy to the hospital. This vampire and this doc. These two doctors are operating. One is is just this random guy, and the other is the uh, female lead of the movie named Karen Jensen and basically as they are analyzing him he comes back alive and eats the neck out of one of the doctors until and then the girl here's here's the thing that just weirds me out the entire time she sees her colleague's neck beating gouged out she just has the most blank stare not even like not even like disgusted or horrified just like Oh, oh thank God. shit, I missed my dying. fucking... It's like, oh shit, I missed my buddy taping of uh, Dane Cook on HBO. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. It's yeah. so freaking retarded. And then she's just like, oh, oh no, it's a vampire. And then she runs out of the room, and he starts uh, sucking her blood, and then uh, Blade shows up and basically like uh, tries to kill, finish him off, but he escapes. So he decides to save her and takes her to... Uh, his mentor Abraham, who's uh, played by Chris Christopherson, and basically just, you just call him Whistler throughout the whole just thing. Whistler. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and basically, like he explains, like about the war between the with the vampires 
and basically like how Blade and them are like vampire hunters. And, and that's where they also explain where he found Blade. So basically, so what they said was uh, Whistler found Blade when he was like 14 or when he was a teenager or something like that. So I'm get to answer your question, O'Connor. I get I'm guessing he was going through the adoption system, and then after that, they just fucking threw him out. That that could make more sense now because if he was adopted, you know, like he he was thir- But he said he found him on the streets. That's yeah, the only that's thing why I said me. they threw him out. Yeah. Or either that, or he killed his fucking foster family. Mm, that could be it too. <laughs> Anyways, then it goes to. After they try to get, basically get her to <coughs> run away because she's been marked by this vampire, he goes to a scene about this meeting of these vampire elders, where there's two factions. There's the younger ones who are basically, uh, I think it's I don't think they were two factions. I think it's just one society and Deacon Frost <laughs> leading a younger group that wants more exposure. Yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with factions. It's just two different ideologies that are it's part of like, the same group. Yeah, like they're just like newer vampires, while like the other ones are like vampires who've been like going pure on, bread. who've been mm-hmm. like basically born vampire, not like. Yeah, they're purebred. Yeah, <laughs> purebred somehow. Uh, well, that's they like, were born vampires. Yep, and then yeah, basically this doesn't follow like the idea of you know the undead the vampires are undead they basically have the same structures they they could eat food if they wanted to they can smoke if they want to it's just that they have to drink blood because yeah. they can't because they can't sustain I don't know them they food. never actually show them eating food hmm and anyways basically what happens is uh basically uh frost declares vampire martial law and basically uh, basically becomes the god emperor of vampires. <laughs> yeah. And basically then... For a short time. Yeah, I guess then. When they go back to basically... Then it basically goes to where uh, vampires start showing up trying to attack Karen because of the mark. There's a police guy who's a familiar. And uh, mm-hmm. basically does some shit where he finds this archive of vampire history. Which I I'm pretty sure it's the one with the fat vampire, or whatever the fuck that was. Pearl. Pearl. I, I don't know, dude. You you're kind of it, it sounds like you're fucking explaining the story a little out of order. Yeah. Maybe. It's just. It it's just so. This movie is just so weird. I don't know. I don't think it's that weird. It's pretty. It's a pretty straightforward movie. It is straightforward, but it's like oh god. Yeah. Like you have your setups, and most of them have payoffs. The only time there wasn't a payoff was Whistler having cancer, and then two scenes later, he's fucking dead. Oh, Very yeah. true. It's literally curb stomped. I know. I mean, even the fucking garlic mace had a payoff at the end. Oh man! Actually, you know what? You um, Jeff, do you want to finish the rest of the synopsis? Uh, you pretty much already got it. You know, they find the familiar, he leads them around, and then after that, some shenanigans lead back to, what was it, the the archive with Pearl, and Pearl leads them back to Deacon. Yeah. Or then, rather, the, uh, the, what's it, the hard drive that they steal leads them yeah. back to Deacon. And, and then during... Ritual. Yeah, and then during that, they show the whole thing about how Blade has to take the serum... So that he doesn't want to, like, eat people and drink yeah. their blood. And then, basically, like, shit happens. Uh, they find out that this um, alternative thing to try to replace the serum uh, makes uh, the vampire blood cells basically explode. So she decides yeah. to uh, use her doctor knowledge and find a vaccine to cure like people who become familiars, I guess. Not but, familiars, but people that I have been turned. Yeah, but it doesn't work on. So like, she explains it. She says that there's no cure for purebred vampirism, but people that have been turned can be cured. But it's un it's unclear whether or not Blade can be affected by that cure since he was because born it's it. like sickle cell anemia. <laughs> well, she explains it with like some fucking blood. It's just blood hilarious because magic shit. 
Yeah, it's just hilarious because it's like the main cast for this, the main lead woman and the lead lead man, of course, are, you know, black. And I just love that they use sickle cell and mean here to explain how they can cure themselves. It's like, wait, really? like, that's a bit on the nose movie. <laughs> I don't, wait, hold I on. Don't let me, really let me try to remember. So. Wait, why is that on the nose? Is that like a... Because sickle cell anemia is basically a common thing inside black people. Yeah, it's a... Or a common disease among black people. Yep. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's very sad. Mm-hmm. Oh. I don't think there's really anything on the nose about it. It's just... It was... I, I guess it was just a way that they can compare the two. Because yeah, she asked why it. because she asked why do they why do vampires need blood? And Whistler responds by saying because their because their own blood can't sustain them. And that's how she compares it to sickle cell anemia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, then after that, of course, then Frost and his uh, the other vampires attack their hideout. Uh Whistler basically dies, Karen gets abducted, and then basically now Blade has to go after the guy. Um I'm trying to remember, was that the the scene before they go to the penthouse, that was the park, right? Yeah, the park yeah, scene where basically the, that yeah, was the where... main villain is able to talk to Blade during the day because he put on, like, SPF 10 million sunblock. Uh, which yeah. I find hilarious because it's like, yes, sunblock works on skin. Right now his eyes should be exploding out of his face. Yeah. Because he's not a daywalker, so... Well, he wasn't oh. technically in the sun. He was still in the shade, but, you know, it's, <laughs> oh, it's boy, fucking whatever. Yeah. Some bullshit there. And basically there's a scene where he has this little Asian girl hostage. And mm. it's, like, really weird. And then at the end when Blade's just like, shit, I'm just gonna shit you instead of to get you off her. He throws her through a fucking, like... Popcorn like, vendor. A popcorn vendor. And then almost gets she almost gets run over by a car. But yeah, she gets try almost gets run over a bus because I don't I don't know. I guess whenever you live in this city, it doesn't matter. You can see a cop being beaten to half to death on the back of his own freaking cop car. Nobody's gonna bat an eye. Same thing with a little kid going through a popcorn vendor and landing up on the street. It's just like you don't think the no little girl is like involved. knocked out unconscious or has like a shit ton of glass in her out. face. Uh, good God. The movie's good. I mean, it's a it's a good movie if you just don't think about too. Oh, for God's sake! Well, what now? I mean, well, he's still just, watching the movie right now. I'm watching the talking. end of the movie, talking. so I'm seeing I'm seeing Blade doing roundhouse kicks in front of a roundhouse kick guy, and it looked like two people just doing roundhouse kicks right in front of each no, other. No, that's see. Five. I remember that. Okay, we're gonna get let's get to that in a second. Before that, just talking about this fucking park scene. And seeing how this guy is basically like like has a little girl, he's like, "Oh no, you're not going anywhere. You're gonna stay right here. We're gonna we're gonna bargain." And it's like, is this is this like the 1990s like uh, symbolism to like modern Hollywood? I don't it's just think like so. this pasty friggin' guy, like sickly guy who's like just like I touching little girls. I think you're thinking too much about. It. I think both of you are thinking a little too much about this movie. It's very fucking straightforward. Sure. Yeah, it's just... There's there's vampires and they're assault? bad, and there's Blade who just wants to kill vampires. Yeah. Anyway, stuff happens. He tries to go save her, and then finds out that his mom is alive and she's now a vampire, and that uh, the main villain was the one who basically infected both of them. And so yeah. basically now they're gonna do this thing where he's gonna sacrifice a bunch of people including his henchmen to become the blood god and uh, basically he get like he gets used he gets like basically sucked dry and then basically Karen has to basically save her with his with her own blood and but he become basically starts well, to go stuck. they just slit his wrist yeah and then he goes feral and then yeah you have the big fight scene, and then we get to this one part where I am, and then I literally look at this. I'm like, "Is this the inspiration for Star Wars Episode Three with the bloody white saber, just like back and forth, back and forth, doing the same symmetrical movement?" I don't know. I like the choreography in this movie. Like, it was actually really good. But... No, like, I I like the choreography, but there's this one part where it's like as Nick Hunter was talking about just now. Where both of them just do roundhouse kicks back and forth without anything happening. 
Yes. Oh, and God, that, that and now cool. I've just seen uh, the main villain get split in half, yet because he has like this blood of the blood god in him, he, he goes, his top half goes flying off, but the blood stayed connected and basically acted like a bungee cord to bring him back together. Yeah, because he's immortal now. Oh. Oh, God, the Lord. And now I'm back to fucking auto tune, you know, the refreshing hell stuff. And then, anyways, basically the minions go down. Now he's like, oh, I'm going to fight you now, Frost. I think we should go back to talking about the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I like about the choreography in this movie was, you know, it wasn't. The camera wasn't all up in the action. It was actually pulled back, and you could actually see the actors or the stunt doubles doing what they need to do. And that's what I really liked about the movie. Because, mm -hmm. you know, most of the time, or actually, you know, a lot of the times in most modern action movies, action is just always up in your face with the camera just super close and tight. Whereas in this one, there's a lot of wide angles for for your actions so that way you can actually see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Did fucking Hal just disappear? Yeah, sorry. Jesus Christ. <sighs> Hydration. Anyways, I guess yeah, we get to the last part of the movie where he literally, um, he's like, oh, I'm invincible, but it's like, oh wait, the fucking drug thing, exploder thing, can kill him. So they literally Yeah, that part doesn't actually make much sense when I think about it. I told I told you not to think about it, but going off the movie's own logic, that really doesn't make a lot of sense, considering he got chopped in half with silver and was still able to re regen himself. Yeah. I, I think what he's basically saying is it's anticoagulant. Because it's uh, such a big dose of anticoagulant, his blood ability to like come back and stick together is no longer available to him. It's so thin that he just can't come back. Probably. Yeah, I guess so. And then it's like something out of like the fly where he turns into a giant tomato and then blows up. <laughs> yeah. As I said, the attack of the kill of tomatoes, I yeah. felt like for a couple scenes. Hmm. <sighs> and then the shit ends and then, yeah, this saves the girl and that's he goes and goes off and does his thing again and that's basically it that's the movie yeah i i'm actually some things i did like about this is like this almost seems like the old like the the old the villains it's like the old people versus the young people you know like the the older vampires the ones that are pure blood they basically are like Let's not fuck with people. Let's just keep going, staying underground. We don't have to make a lot of waves. We have a good life here. We can just take some victims every couple of times because, hey, we have the government in our pocket. We have the police in our pocket. It doesn't matter. We'll just go ahead and just drain a couple people, and we don't gotta we don't gotta cause trouble. But then it's a young hip guy. He's like, no, we should rule over these people. We should like take over everything and all that stuff. And it's literally just old sensibilities versus young people that feel like they have to be the center of attention. I mean, the why does Blade start coming after these people? Because the one guy has a literal rave in a goddamn meat packing plant. Well, that and they're vampires. And yeah, he like and they're vampires. vampires, and he doesn't like vampires. Exactly. Yeah, or yeah, I guess. Uh, do you have anything else to add? Oh, dear God. We're in Russia. Oh, good. Uh, Why are we in Russia? Russia? At the very end. Yeah, oh. so at the end, Blade takes his hunt international now. Mm -hmm. Yes. But they actually explain that later on in uh, the sequel, Why He's in Russia, which is actually kind of... I like it. Mm. But it's been a while since I've seen the sequel. Yeah, I haven't seen the sequel. I don't think I've seen two. I remember seeing some of Trinity. It's been a long time, though. Like This is like going back to... like I remember like when I was in junior school and I would see billboards for Blade Trinity. <laughs> and it was just... It's like a blast from the past, even just talking about this movie. Yeah, this is the first time I've ever seen it, and I'm 19... surprised. 
Ah, I wasn't really into the superhero movies and vampires, you know, mm. like. Well, I didn't even know this was a superhero movie when I saw it. I didn't even know Blade was a comic book character until maybe a few years later when I saw a fucking when I saw yeah. a Blade comic from the '90s just sitting on a yeah. shelf, and I was like, "Oh, okay, cool." Mm-mm. Although it's funny, even looking at the post, like the poster for the movie, at a certain resolution, it almost looks like Blade is a character out of like the original Deus Ex. I definitely see and... Deus Ex. Uh, a little bit of inspiration for Deus Ex in this. I see a lot of inspiration in uh, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines in this, especially the way the vampires die. That's like, literally, they took what happens to vampires in this movie and just placed it into what would happen in the game. Yeah. Well, I just think the trench coat look has always been cool. So Yeah, of course. But we, I don't think we ever really saw it in a movie until, until Blade. And then yeah. we had The Matrix... Yeah. That made it even more popular yeah. with black trench coats and sunglasses and nightclubs and yeah. cool ass techno music. And don't forget, during that whole standoff in the park scene with the one million FPS, they uh, had the first you know bullet dodge scene. Yeah, oh, the slow mo bullet dodge. Yeah, yeah. Man, the Wachowskis yeah, are even was... bigger hacks than I expected. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just. And I'm like I said there, at the though. beginning, this movie, or this was the first R-rated comic book movie too. Yeah. Uh, the things that I just didn't get with the movies, like I, I'm seeing the old vampires, you know, like they're putting up with this snob. I'm like, why has no one just put a steak into this guy? I mean, literally, he's seen because he's it would taste too delicious. <laughs> it just it doesn't make sense to me. It's like. Oh, I'm just going to let this guy who keeps on flippantly t- uh, deciding not to follow our ways. We're going to let him around. And then, oh, crap, he killed Well, they never guy. really had a reason to fucking kill him. He was just, he was just a fucking young, oh, well, I guess, I don't know. They, they don't explain like how old he is. He was just like, the hired he help. Is. Yeah. Yeah. It's just- he was just some fucking kid. Or to their eyes, you know, he was just a new vampire, so... I guess they were hoping he'd eventually just, you know, learn their ways and stop with his bullshit, but... Oh, so nope. it's kind of like Europe with... Muslims, right? <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Let's, let's keep that shit till the end. <laughs> okay. Yeah, good lord. Uh, anyways, let's just talk about, like, just, I guess, coming stuff. Uh, the soundtrack. The one thing I will give Blade that has at least done really well was the atmosphere. The yeah. atmosphere of this movie is done really well, that especially for Cape world shit. Building. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially the club scene alone is just, like, like, just a fucking, just an iconic scene from, like, how well it sets everything up. Mm-hmm. And it's like, shit. And, like, it's funny even just the legacy it's had on a lot of mediums, that one scene, where it's like you're in this desperate situation and then suddenly fucking everything just drops and it's like shit. Like, shit's just about to fucking happen right here. It also makes sense why the co- you know, the cops aren't somebody that you can help. They literally explain the cops are in their pocket. And yeah. it makes a whole lot more sense now. Like at the very beginning of the movie, all the cops are attacking the person, which you know. And I'm like, why do Those they have a cops. machine? Those were just fucking bodyguards, dude. Uh, really? Those yes. Those were just bo- bodyguards. Yes, uh, they were. I'm, talk- I'm not talking about the one in the wave scene, though. It's like after the uh, Chris B. McNugget went into the hospital, and he basically attacks the one doctor. Who comes back at the end of the movie? And what? yeah, the the one young doctor, you know, that gets drained. Yeah, he because it, I'm pretty sure they took him to get him out of there, and then after that, they just they fucking throw him in that tomb. Because uh-huh. Deacon even says himself that you know there's a chance they may turn into a vampire, but there's also still a chance that they may turn into something worse, which is whatever the fuck it was that doctor turned into. Which, you know, he's still down there. Mm-hmm. They don't actually kill him. He stays down there him. for... He's just down there he, for the rest of his life. On yeah. life, whatever. But until he, you know, desiccates so much that he can't move. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Just... And then I guess... I just... 
but like I said, whenever it was like with the doctors, all of a sudden the cops come in and the cops start going after Blade. And well, you know, he's shooting the with one with the fucking stuff. gun and the sword on his back. Yes, but then another guy comes out with an AR, like an, like an, a s- literal machine gun. And it's like, this is a hospital thing. And it's like, why does the person have a machine gun in a hospital? You know, you know, we, it's just. Are you talking about the doc? Are you, are you talking about like a doctor in there or are you talking about a cop? A cop, like whenever Wesley Snipes is running away with the woman, you know, she they're on the second roof. They've just done the giant throw, which should have killed the woman. And the you know she well, comes it over just with him. her so- shoulder just because yeah, he threw it her into a pile of garbage. Yes, true. And he jumps over. Then the cops are shooting at them with like their pistols out of the window. Then another cop comes in with like a high powered machine gun and starts shooting the it's just shooting a fucking at them. assault rifle. Yeah. And it's you're, like, you're really exaggerating the scene and trying to make it sound like something that it's not. <laughs> you could say that, but it's like this thing is punching through a, uh, like a metal stupid? door up, up yes. above and leaving you like these big like one inch craters in the door. Yeah, the impact will do that. <sighs> Just, you don't don't fucking makes, argue guns with me when guns I'm, are my fucking. I'm not job, gonna argue with guns with you, Jack. But it makes a whole lot more sense it, with the cops being on it. Yes, they bring out the big guns for Blade. Yep. Yeah, dude. I I, I don't really know where you're trying to go with with this. I'm just saying, like, to me, the cops basically at the very beginning. I had an issue with the cops being like. Why are they just trying to take this guy down? I mean, like... Uh, because he had a fucking gun in yeah. a hospital. Yeah, he does. But then all of a sudden they bring out an AR... They bring out a giant machine gun for the same guy. Not a guy. giant machine gun. It's just a fucking assault rifle. <sighs> yes, but do you, do you literally bring that to you whenever somebody's like, oh, somebody has a yes, gun? Yes, you do. Dude, I... <sighs> I, oh my god, dude. Do you, do you not remember what my fucking job is? I know what your fucking job is. Yeah, so quit trying to fucking say it's impractical for that situation because it's not. I'm I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's like the, the, the reason the cops probably got called in the first place was for a crispy critter suddenly jumping up. It's Blade coming that suddenly, you know, puts off their alarm bells. And, you know, yeah, because Blade them. had a fucking gun out in the open in the hospital. That's why they it was opened like fire five, on him. Yeah, but it was like five minutes. They, if, uh, never mind. Uh, I'm yeah, just saying fucking that, drop that shit. Because they're fucking don't really know what you're talking about. Can I just say, though, it's like really impracticable that one other thing I uh, pointed out, and this is just me. I love that the hospital, the office into another room in the hospital has double doors, like a surgery room, but it's where it keeps all its supplies and documents and all that stuff. Because nah. that's the whole thing. It's like this double doors that lead to nowhere. Ex- I mean, it just looked like office. an area of the hospital that was under construction. Oh, welcome to a movie set. Yeah, true. Yeah, they just couldn't afford it. All right, well, I guess that talks about some things. Uh, the other thing that I guess we could also talk about is the acting itself. Uh, for the it's most part, Wesley deep. Snipes did a pretty decent charismatic job as Blade. Mm-hmm. But the other actors, again, I can say enough about the female lead, whatever I her name is, decent. is just very inconsistent at times. Yeah, it's just, oh, for God's sake. Yeah. I don't know. I thought she was, well... I don't know. I don't think you can say she was inconsistent just because of, you know, her role and the position that she was thrown into where she just goes from being a fucking blood doctor to a, uh, I don't know, like just being thrown into this world that she had no idea even existed. I just, whenever it comes to her, it's like, she seems kind of like the weakest part of this and as a main act, uh, actress. She doesn't really have a lot of. She does. She's basically just there, kind of. I don't. Yeah, she's, she's provides, not just there, dude. She did a lot of shit. She fucking found a cure for vampirism, and she found a new way to blow up vampires. I'm not talking, yes. but I think Truth what we're me. not talking though about is not the character, but the actress herself. Yeah, I, know, I didn't. I didn't really have a problem with her. I thought she did pretty good. I just, I just felt like 
you know, she played it off, and I just wasn't really. She seemed like completely nonplussed almost whenever the stuff was happening. How can I say this? Like, if I was playing, if I was playing the character, and I just nearly got thrown off a subway system right next to another subway car, I'd be pretty much screaming my head off. Well, maybe she kept a cool head. <laughs> she she was a doctor, and that's the thing. It's like she's a blood doctor. This is not something she sees a well, lot. Well, she even tells Blade like early on, "Hey, the only way I'm going to survive is if I stick with you. So if you're going to stick with Blade, you kind of." got to keep your cool otherwise you're just going to get fucking killed. Uh, true. Yeah, I guess. Uh, so. And uh, then there's the other actors. Uh Stephen Dorff is like he's not like exceptional. He he's just awesome as shit, dude. Who's Stephen Dorff? Yeah. I don't know. I think I think it was kind of uh Oh, that he, he did as well as scene. the writing gave him. I you think. know it's 1998 whenever the guy turns off the turns on the gas pump before the thing even gets into the car and just starts, you know, wasting all this gas just before we fill a car. And I'm like, stop, please. Stop. That's caused so much now. I thought that was kind of funny. But I don't know. Dude. <laughs> fucking Deacon Frost was fucking cool as shit. He just had yeah. fucking style and charisma throughout that whole movie. I yeah, it's so. like, I got cancer. I'll smoke while filling up a car. No, you're thinking of Whistler. We're talking about Deacon Frost, you moron. Oh, Deacon Frost, though. Okay, yeah. Okay, Deacon Frost to me seems like... I'm not going to say he's cool. I think he's a douchebag. That's, That's why I like him. Okay, then. Uh, I just... I'm just like, somebody just put a bullet through this guy's face. Please. So yeah, he did his job well. <laughs> he literally did his job well. Yeah, yeah. That, so he did his job well. I'm not saying he was a bad actor. I'm just saying I did not. I thought the character could. I mean, as I said before, this character made the main star from Twilight seem a little bit more pleasant in my, in, in hindsight. Well, to be fair, Robert Pattinson is a ten out of ten gay boy. <laughs> like wood wreck boy pussy. Mm -hmm. Alright, oh, well, Lord. and then we have those, and then, uh... uh... What about the, like, henchman vampire that lost both his arms, and it felt... I like that running like... gag oh, yeah. the whole thing. We're like, hey, wait, I got two new arms I'm gonna fuck you up with. He just yeah. fucks him up at the end. Like, not, not even trying. Exactly, and it's just like... And the... The main character threatens to cut off the one person's arm again. I'm like, really? This, we're going to do this? And then they subvert it and like, no, no. It's just Joshua with you. Yeah. <sighs> and then, well, let me think. There was one thing I was going to say, but now it's kind of slipped my mind. I, I will tell you, though, the only time the CGI really failed for me is whenever it was like the regenerating blood effect. And the tomato thing. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the other one I thought was kind of almost grating was when those guys were getting used to summon the blood god. Uh, and then, and like, skeleton skeletons bats skeletons come out of their bodies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for God's sake. And that's that's one thing also. It, I, I just could stand. I, I, that's another thing that really got to me. It's like, it's like the old guard is being forced to basically be a sacrifice for this upstart. Yeah. I mean that that was the whole plan. Yeah. Was, you know, the runes that were that were being shown off or the also, sacrifices that he needed. Also the whole, you know, like 3D representation of what needs to happen in order to be able to do it. I'm like, "Oh, I was watching this. I was like, oh, I see if 12 vampires get together in a circle, we can start a shitty reboot for reboot." No, I think I think they needed like the that specific bloodline of vampire. Oh yeah, because because they also said that like the glyph they use basically yeah. determines who the vampire is. Yeah. So each person a vampire had to be there. It... Yeah, I yeah. think that's how it worked. I don't really remember. I mean, yeah. like I, I just watched the movie like last week. <laughs> I just kind of wish, though, that, like, his transformation into the Blood God wasn't just his eyes became red. Yeah. Which seemed kind of cheap. 
<laughs> yeah, that was that was pretty cheap. It's like I you mean, make it him. was either it was either make him a crazy beast monster or just give him the you know the blood rubber band shit. Or you could have like made it where his blood literally turns red, like his body turned red or something. You know? No, that would have looked fucking awful. Hmm. No, I mean you already saw what happened when they threw the the fucking hemoglobin inside him. Mm -hmm. Oh, true. Uh, that that would have looked really fucking bad, and I'm glad they didn't do something stupid like that. And, uh, that you know, they knew their budget, and they knew not to blow it on something extravagant at the end. I'm pretty certain, though, if this movie was made like today, like there was no past of it, they they would definitely rip off the nano machine sun scene or something like that. Yeah. No, nah, I don't think so. Video games don't have that much of an influence on movies yet. Not nah, true. Yet. Movies have an influence on video games. That's that 100% very true. true. Uh, shout out to Gone Home. <laughs> yeah, fuck that. All right, and then I guess uh, what's kind of what do you, what do you guys think though about this movie overall? Like, is this something you would I, say to I, someone like you should watch? This? I mean, when I first saw this, I liked it, and going back into it, I kind of like it even more now, just because Me? of all the things that it kind of you know it started. You know, the cool trench coat, the cool techno, the sunglasses and clubs. <laughs> Uh, you know, it was it was a fucking like like I said in the, like I've said I think like two other times. Like, this was pretty much like the first R-rated movie or R-rated uh, comic book movie or superhero movie that actually did really well. Like, well, for the time, you know, yeah. for '98, which uh, I'm trying to find the numbers right now, but I know it had a, uh, I know it ha uh, it got a positive return on its money. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so you know, it had a budget of forty-five million, and U.S. gross was seventy million. So yeah, you know, I, I, that's that's a pretty good one. Opening weekend, you know, it was seventeen million, but I mean that that's opening weekend for you know practically one of the first comic book movies to come out, which really isn't that bad for the time. Mm -hmm. Worldwide release, it had one hundred thirty-eight thirty-one million dollars. So I think it's, uh, you know, I think that says a lot about, you know, the kind of the first few comic book movies. I don't, I don't know how Spawn did, but uh, I don't think it ever really made its money back. I am not sure about that, actually. Let me check that. I, I get that you definitely do like this film. To me, I, I think it's kind of cheesy, but it's a good type of cheesy, in my, yeah. in my personal opinion. Huh. Like, funny enough. I just. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Al. No, I was going to say, funny enough, his character was literally only created five years before it actually got adapted to a movie. It, he was originally created, I believe, by Todd McFarlane back in 1992. And then uh, literally Spawn. the film came out in 97. Talking about Spawn? Yeah. Yeah. And then I think in terms of the budget, it was $40 million was the budget, and it grossed 87.8. So it made about double its budget. Yeah, I guess that's not too bad. It yeah. probably just broke even, though. Yeah, to, to me, I like like I said before, this movie just seems like there's so much cheese to it. I mean, like I saw as soon as the woman was testing that, uh, you know, it would touch the hilt of the blade, then the thing like went around in a circle one time, and then giant like sharp blades jumped out of the hilt, and then. Just, went right back in i knew like okay the vampire is going to pick that up and it's he's going to hold on to it until it finally like chops his hand off and, and you're expecting stuff. that to happen and it fucking doesn't <laughs> oh. because because fucking frost picks it up and he's just sitting there with it and blades like oh it's gonna cut this motherfucker's hand mm -hmm. and deacon's just like nah i know everything about you and it's uh, like another, oh shit another thing i liked is like the old isn't really um the old you know the old vampires the these new upstarts basically don't care about anything because they go into the archives and uh, well archives archives i mean <laughs> but 
you basically see Frost there in the archives, and he's trying to translate this uh, ancient script. And one of the old vampires is saying, the, the inscriptions are – it's a dead language. You're never going to untranslate it. Yeah. And he start, walks away, and the whole thing is – Whenever Blade goes in, he goes into this room, you know, the, and it has basically the book of the Vampire Bible, which is like written in oh, blood yeah. on these giant parchment things. The new vampires come in there. Every single one of those pieces of paper are now completely gone and disintegrated. Yeah, I, 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 I had a problem with that, too. I was like, eh, this, is, this is supposed to be like your Bible, and you're just in here just fucking wrecking shit up. But that is the one thing I like. It's these new vampires do not care about how the past was done. They yeah, don't care. Is... They got their information from the past, how to become a blood god. No, yeah. anything else is perfectly fine with them. They, yeah, they can destroy true. it. They can do whatever they want with it. And But then it comes to the cheese moment where Blade's like, I found this laying on the floor. And he's like, hmm. This is instructions on how to create a blood god, but I can't really re do anything else. He's like, the guy said it was a dead language. How is a hick? Well, fucking, I, I think like, it's the I, I think it's the transcript from the tomb, and then it's the transcript from the the vampire Bible. I, I think they may just be on like two different eras, like the tomb uh, and then the Bible are separate. Okay, that might make sense. The old and the New Testament. Yeah, like the, <laughs> okay, yeah. I, that. That's that's the only way I could explain it. Was okay, that makes a bit more sense. Then. If it's from two different eras and one is in a dead language, then yeah. yeah, okay, that makes a little bit more sense to me. Especially with the old guy being a vampire hunter, he definitely tried to figure that out. But yeah, it's that's one thing I really did enjoy. It's like showing that these new vampires they don't care about tradition. They want to just you know because gain power. And basically, they're using it as a way to become better than everybody. You know, like they're not going to be humans; they're not even going to be vampires anymore. They they are going to be. He's going to become a god, and he's going to lord it all over him. It's basically the main villain had penis envy. Well, he was. That is a good way to put it. Whole thing. Or yeah, insecure about you know just being a fucking, <laughs> I guess, kind of a mutt. Yeah, and it's like, oh, he he only got turned. He wasn't a pure blood vampire. Well, I'll show you. I'm going to become the god of all vampires. <laughs> but wait, uh, the only way you can do that is by sacrificing us. Oh, it's a good idea. Okay, let's fucking round him up. Mm -hmm. Well, they did Auschwitz. Like they said, the person the person thought it was just a dead language. I mean, I don't know how he found the temple that quickly. <laughs> That's a thing. Because it's, well, it fucking, weird because it's a fucking David Goyer in New York plot. or whatever. Yeah. The, that's it's another thing I love. It's like, oh, good. The temple was only five minute drive away. I know. Like, when I saw that, I I wondered, and like, had it had it always been there, or is this just a recreation of it? Yeah. Like, I really don't fucking know. It's, it's I'm, a. It's a cape movie. It it's weekly. always just all yeah, convenient. Yeah, you're true. right. Uh, now, now I'm starting to think too much about it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's like if you think too much about the movie, it's going to just have glaring problems to you. But well, yeah, if you I, don't I, think too bad, well, I, I don't think it has glaring problems. But yeah, Dude. since you brought that up, it, it's like, huh? Yeah, like why was it there? Dude, yeah, dude, exactly. you just gotta turn off your brain and have fun. Can't yeah. you be like your cousin Johnny? Turn off your brain. You know, like 420 plays it. Oh, for God's sake. Yeah, that's that's the only thing that I just couldn't... Uh, I, I just like that. But like I said, it's a cheesy movie. It's a good movie, but it's cheesy. It definitely, it definitely, it definitely has that 90s aesthetic to it. Personally, I like. I would probably done. recommend it to most people, just because of the fact that I'd most recommend people it to Black this. Lives Matter because they got a cop being beaten to death. Oh, was um, death. all right. Well, let's let's leave that for another time, okay? Okay. Not talk about fucking Black Lives Matter because mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with this movie. True. This, this is a racially inclusive movie, and then had a very diverse cast. Yeah. With a strong, oh, yeah. independent black female lead. I'm going to save something for after this is over. 
Yeah. Actually, you know, no, no, think about it. This probably would have won every Oscar if this came out in 2018. Yeah, pretty so. much. And speaking of which, uh, Wesley Snipes is in a mountain of debt, so uh, I guess this is probably a good time to make that Blade reboot and actually get you out of debt, Wesley. <laughs> yep. I wouldn't personally mind. I would love another fucking Blade movie. Hey, I can, I've I... I've always been waiting for one. Like even yeah. when Trinity came out, I still liked it just because it was Blade, which yeah. is I don't know. The only thing is, it must it must be Wesley Snipes. No other actor. No fucking Michael uh, B. Jordan. Did, no fucking did, did whoever the guy was from Get the, Out. Uh, the TV or the TV show. You, you never saw the the TV show Blade. No, I have never seen the TV show. Uh, okay, so when I watched it, I, I mean, I kind of liked it. Like I, I pretty much tuned in like every week just to watch it. Was it a live action TV series? Yeah, it was. It was a live action TV show. Well, who was the lead actor? I have no idea, but every time Blade popped up and it wasn't Wesley Snipes, I was just like, ah, it needs to be Wesley Snipes. Yeah. I mean, but it's a TV show. You can't fucking get Wesley Snipes for a TV show. The only other actor I would say that I would like be okay with would be like Forrest Whitaker. Yeah. Just because he has that like pizzazz. Where he's like, I'm going right. to fuck some shit up. So I, I want to ask you guys, do y'all know... Where the lion, some motherfuckers always got to try to ice skate up hills, came from. He uh, says no, it at I the know. end. Nick Honor, do you know? I do not know. Okay, <laughs> so this was back to a meeting with Wesley Snipes. Uh, when I, I think they were in a meeting with like a bunch of directors and uh, executives, and <laughs> Wesley Snipes just said it. And the writer, uh, what's his name, David S. Goyer. He just looks at he looks at Wesley and is like it's like that's it that's the line, and he he tried really hard not to get the line in the movie, but David S. Goyer wanted it in there, like as the final line that he says to Deacon Frost, and then oh, when man. you think about it, it's like what does that actually mean? Like like some things are hard, but people do it anyways or something. I think it was supposed more like a play on his words since his name's Frost. Frost goes to ice, and I, I really don't who, think that's what it that's what it was supposed to mean. I think he just <laughs> yeah, but that's it, a it's thing. just it's the like, fact that David S. Goyer liked that line and he wanted it in the movie. <laughs> and then when you watch it in the context, it doesn't make any sense. All right. Well, I say, uh, what do you think? No, uh, what do you? I think I'd say that if I had to rate this movie, I think I'd give it a good seven out of ten. It's a bit cheesy, uh, but I, I think say it's a seven. Decent. Personally, I don't think I'm gonna give it like I don't think I'm gonna give it like maybe like I don't like to use maybe a out of ten ranking, maybe like like a different maybe stars or like a letter ranking. But personally, I would probably give this movie probably like a solid C. Hmm. C. Okay. Yeah, I'd give it a C too. Yeah. I don't know. Like, it does I, a I lot of really stuff, but it also is a bit much. dated, I find. Oh, yeah, it, it's definitely dated with the 90s aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I guess some parts definitely still can apply now, and they can still at least make it an enjoyable movie. I just don't think it's anything, like, substantial. I just don't think it's, like, I mean, anything... I think you could still pull off the, the fucking leather trench coat and sword and sunglasses. Yeah, like, it did a lot of like, stuff stylistically. modern day. Sure, it did a lot of stuff stylistically. I just personally think it didn't do a lot of stuff in terms of the substance of like the f story of the film, as well as the theme of the film. Even though I guess it kind of was like the first real like gritty like vampire supernatural like action movie. Yeah. But yeah, I guess that's kind of my thing. Anyways, is there any final thoughts you guys want to say about this movie? Uh. Shit, like I said, you know, I definitely recommend this movie. You know, I, I I can still watch it today and still get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Yeah. First, uh, honestly, I'd say like here's the thing: if you like to watch like cape shit, uh, this is some pretty good cape shit. <laughs> so for yeah, the, you uh, probably the watch invasion this. of the Saturday morning cape shit on movies. Yeah. Like, look, you, you, like, look. If you like, if you, if you sincerely talk about Marvel movies, 
you have shit taste in film, just watch this movie. You'll probably enjoy it. Mm-hmm. I would say that if you like vampire movies and, you know, like, you want something that's a little bit more action-oriented, then it is more like a romance or a thriller or something like that. Uh, this is a good movie. It has an interesting take on the vampires. The They actually do try to set up the vampires, like, cast system. And personally, I... I could watch a, I could have watched a movie where it's basically just dealing with the old men vampires, you know, people trying to, you know, the movers and shakers of the world. <laughs> One vampire is even like, uh, do you have our accounts in order? He's like, yeah, I've sent them to the bank. And it's like, these people are bureaucrats and they are locked in. Like some of these vampires probably were there whenever the Mayflower came over. You could even have some of that stuff. That's a very interesting analogy. All right. Okay, well that's that's our review of Blade. So uh, I guess I guess the consensus is a C. That's still pretty good for what it is. Um, so now just so we can end the show, let's just talk about like some stuff that's been going on lately with film. Uh, two of the big stories. One is the sequel to Pacific Rim. Uh, just came out not block in the theaters this weekend. Uh, I was gonna go watch that movie, but uh, me and my, the it's weird the theaters that that we have around here you reserve seats. So uh, that's kind of the we same looking... for like the yeah. new releases near me. Yeah. So we went there or, you know, we were looking on the app for like some seats, but all the seats were just singles, like separate from each other. So we we're just like, well, fuck it. Like, I guess we're not going to watch, uh, watch this movie now. It's like so the opposite we, uh, of no singles policy. Yeah, no. So <laughs> then after that, I was looking through the, uh, the other listings and they had death wish. And I was like, hey, pull up the seatings for Death Wish. And sure enough, we were able to find, like, seats, you know, for us. But yeah, man. Uh, How'd you Death like it? Wish, Death Wish was really fucking good. Mm-hmm. I agree. Oh, man, that movie. I like what they did with it. You know, for being a remake, they use, you know, they don't try to make it exactly like the original movie, and they actually try to build off of you know what what happened here like i said in like a, a past thing whenever we were talking together uh in death wish the guy's a doctor now so he doesn't go home and throw up after his first kill but he still has like the like he can still see it in his head and it's really bothering him so he takes the prescribed you know sleep medication that his uh, therapist gave him to help him get some sleep so it's not that the gore gets to him but it's just, you know, he still has taken a life and it's still a shock to him. It's just in a completely different way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we really need to do a review of, like, the original movie for that, honestly. Yeah, I would love to do Death Wish in the future, but if we're going to yeah. talk about the next movie we're going to do, I'd say we stay on the Wesley Snipes train and watch <laughs> Demolition Man. <laughs> oh, God, I actually really like that song by the police, to be honest. That entire album, Ghost in the Machine, was really good. But yeah, what what were you talking about, Pacific Rim? Mm-hmm. But yeah, Pacific Rim Uprising that came out. Uh, right now, I think it's the weekend gross it got was like 150 million. Only, only I think like 10 percent of that came from the U.S. Most of it came yeah, from it foreign. Me. It's because China are a bunch of whores for meccas, and apparently, uh, they're apparently whores for what's it called, the fucking guy from Star Wars. Yeah, I mean. It wouldn't surprise me if this movie was made just for China and overseas. It literally mm-hmm. is. They didn't make any money in the U.S. Now, I will tell you, I love the original Pacific Rim. I, oh. I like Nick Croner, I like you, the designs. You're officially for... out of here. Get the fuck out. What? <laughs> no, like seriously, though. No. Uh, no, I'm I'm just joking. I don't I don't care. Uh. I just thought like. Personally, I thought it was like really, really mediocre. But I haven't seen it in like two years. No, so. it's it's definitely mediocre. But I'm yeah. like the Chinese people. I like the meccas. Yeah, same. Uh, sure. The like, only problem with that movie is that there wasn't enough mecca in between it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, that's the thing, though. Like, here's the thing. Like, I like the idea of mecha anime with all the exposition they do with the characters. Like going back to yeah. stuff like Gundam and Evangelion and Votums and like Giant Corps. That's the reason that works is because it's a 24 minute episode. 23 yeah, that's the thing whatever. too. 
But even then, the dialogue is interesting, at least for the most part, and they do it in a way that it attracts the eye of the viewer and it keeps you focused. Nothing in Pacific Rim really made me give a shit about the characters. Yeah. I will agree with that, but but as, that's as because said, Pacific Rim was a very large movie, and they just had to condense it just because of, you know, how big the idea was. I guess so, but like honestly, I don't know. I think it would have been. It's definitely done a movie because, like, when it starts out, you know, you're just thrown right into the middle of it with, you know, the entire beginning summed up in like 15 minutes. But yeah, it's definitely like, a movie that could have used that beginning as its own movie to set up the world. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like the, they should have done the movie as almost a prequel and then done like a mini series for it. Maybe. That that was I like feel a like it would have been better structured. Report. Especially the, with the two man pilots. The yeah. one thing that I have to say is the worst thing about the next movie is all the mechs are basically designed on the American mech instead of it like being kind of a conglomeration again. Yeah. <laughs> I loved um, my favorite one from the original movie is Cherno Alpha. I love that one. Oh yeah. Cherno Alpha is like everyone's favorite. It's a fucking nuclear smokestack, basically. I mean, my favorite one has to be the Mexican one, though. The thing was called the fucking Matador, and it was piloted by two fuck by two fucking inmates. Like, did did y'all ever look into the uh, the what's it called, the Pacific Rim Bible or whatever, or the design documents? I never no, I never got a chance to. Oh my god, like it's so detailed. Like every country has one has has their own mech, and Mexico that's... made one just called the Matador or something like that, so and it was the... piloted by two by two inmates that said that like if they if they survive long enough they'll be they'll be released back into the population. So wait, did Guillermo del Toro like literally write an entire fucking background for the entire yeah. universe? He, he mm-hmm. has he, yeah he has an entire background universe for this movie. Like so I, if he really like did said. that, then yeah, why in really God's name, why in God's name did he have to cast literally one of the worst parts of the new Star Wars in this? I don't I don't know, dude. Like, I, I don't know why. Did, they did, did he that. have anything to do with the sequel? Because I, I've really not heard anything about this movie until a month no, ago. No, the lead when actor is literally drop. John Boyega, dude. Uh, you know the Chinese like John Boyega. John Boyega. Yeah, I didn't know that the Chinese liked him. I thought they hated him. I thought so too, but apparently it's like they think, oh, Star Wars, and then they're like, oh, it must be good. I don't know. That's why they put him second build on the fucking poster for the Chinese (sighs) one. Yeah, maybe. Like, even then, like, why not go for someone who's actually a good actor, though? Even Michael B. Jordan would have been fine, yeah, honestly. Even though I don't really money. care for Michael B. Jordan. He's at least a decent actor, though. Even Chatwil Okafor is at least a decent actor. Like, at least at least have the talented ones, and not the guy who's like, Oh, uh, I have the resistance. Oh, oh, you know, me want some white booty. Oh. This is, it's, it's horrible. Mm-hmm. Anyways, and then the it, it's big... it's not just for you know acting. They want a name that's attached to something big that they could probably oh, yeah. get kind of cheap. So yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. But still, yeah, I don't think he's reason. a bigger name than some of those other actors I've named. I yeah, don't think that's so. true. You might as well have had fucking Jordan Peele honestly as the lead actor. It would have been better. Like shit. Anywho, uh, other thing that's going on is uh, there's some movie coming out soon called Ready Player One, which is uh, a oh, book adaption. Oh, God, don't start on that. Uh, or, let's just talk about what what this is, though, because I think this is important to talk about. Because lately in Hollywood, uh, the trend lately has been, have, have you seen things like the Oscars, especially with the quality and the ratings drops and the films coming in that are basically like, Probably one of the weakest crops they've had in a it's long nope. time. And I like 2014, especially with Whiplash. Nope. But this, 
this was bad, especially when they had now, Get Out. Now I think out. you accidentally unplugged your mic, mic jack. Oh, no, sorry, I didn't push T. <laughs> But honestly, like this is like the one year, like this is the one year where they just had one of the worst crops of movies I've seen in a while. Especially when they had Get Out as one of the big films. Which here's the thing: I watched Get Out. It's a it's a decent movie. It is not Oscar worthy by any stretch of the mean. Not and then it was best comedy. Like it's an interest, it's a dark comedy, I guess, in a way. But it's like it's an interesting suspense movie, even though it's a rip off of like this old ass movie from the seventies. A dark comedy, like I'm pretty sure the movie was just supposed to be a, a horror, horror or suspense the horror, whole thing. yeah. But even then, like, like, it was it a decent was, movie. It was classified as a comedy by the fucking by the who was it? Was it was it up for the Emmys or was it the Golden Globes that? No, it was the Golden that Globes that nominated it. Yeah, that's what it was that nominated it as a comedy because they didn't yeah. fucking know. They didn't watch it's... it. They just saw, oh, this is a good, this is a movie made by a couple of diversity people. No, so they looked again. at it and it was like, oh, this is from the guy that made uh, Key and Peele. Yeah, uh, and then it was on Mad TV. Netflix. Speaking was... of which, Jordan Peele was one of my favorite actors on Mad TV. I'm still glad was... he's doing well, but like, he does Netflix not deserve the kind of awards he's getting for this movie. I don't know. I mean, from what I've been hearing from everyone else, it sounds like it's a pretty decent movie, but it's just a movie that's I don't really think it's my type of movie. No, like, it's it's a decent movie. It's just that it's just extremely overrated critically. Uh, like it's it's a solid movie. Like it does the premise well, it does the acting well, it does the most part well, but it's just it's nothing new. It's just a retread of the old like an old plot from the seventies where it's like, Oh, we're, we're basically using you to become like fresh and new again because you know, we're just because here's the funny thing. People thought it was going to be some kind of like racism movie where it's like the white people are like conservatives. They're actually like old school, like, like new Hampshire liberals who become mm-hmm. so fascinated by, uh, like African Americans that they would really want to become African American. It's basically yeah. the fad. It's the fad, yeah. and it's like, this big year has been African-Americans. And it's funny, but then nobody got it. But mm-hmm. it's literally this old, I forget what the movie they were making off of was, but it's basically like they wanted to become fresh and young again. It and so they were putting their, they were putting, basically taking out the guy's brains and putting their own in. I can't remember the name of it. I think it's Being Aaron Brockovich, though. No, 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 basically. it's not that one. That's a different one. Okay, but that has the same kind of plot, doesn't it? Um, no, I thought Aaron Brockovich was the one about the lawyer in West Virginia with the poison water. I'm not sure. I just remember watching him like it was like an art film or something where these people are basically in order to become a new person. They basically open up like a magic door and they walk inside and then you become this person that's linked to this door. And they basically groom the person from life to become like this superstar and then the people just walk in and basically uh, assume his life I can't remember I what know. the movie is but I I thought it was like being Aaron Brockovich or something but I, as I said I think it starred Aaron Brockovich as one of the purse you know people or something like that That's I, I can't remember I saw this thing whenever I was like 16 and that was like 14 years ago I don't know. I'm trying to think of what the movie was. It wasn't Skeleton Key. I think it was something else. It was like from the 70s. No, but Skeleton Key is kind of like that. You know, a more serious take on it. I, I forget what it was. I think it's somewhere here. Let me try to find it. Uh, uh, while you're doing that, uh, want to talk about any of the other new releases. Like the interesting release that I, I actually wanted to saw this one. Uh, did anyone see how I Can Only Imagine is doing? No. Uh, I... I, I was I, actually no, I don't remember that one. I thought you were gonna personally. I thought you for a second you were gonna talk about Isle of Dogs. No, I no, I haven't seen that one yet. Though apparently it's getting shit back blasted for having cultural appropriation. That's like I'm one thinking. thing though. That's that's nothing. It, no, it's because of it's because of the art style. It's just no. it's it's ridiculous. Don't worry about it, honestly. Okay, I'll probably but it's go by see Wes that. Anderson, and Wes Anderson is a fantastic filmmaker. Hmm. I'll go ahead and I'll probably go see that, but 
I got to tell you, I mean, I, I agree with people. The people that are saying, you know, like, I couldn't only imagine this very good film. It's basically a, like, documentary about the life of the, of the person who's, you know, start, front-lined in Mercy Me and stuff. And oh, wait, is that that Christian movie? Yeah, it's a Christian movie. Yeah, my mom, like, I, uh, my mom called me when I went to go see Death Wish. Mm-hmm. And, uh... Oh, shit, I don't remember if it was after or before. I think it was before the movie. But she was like, hey, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm just going to go watch a movie with a friend. And she's like, oh, are you going to go watch uh, I Can Only Imagine? And I was like, uh, no, we're going to go watch Death Wish. <laughs> and she's like, she's, <laughs> I, I, she, she didn't question the movie. But mm-hmm. she was like, you should probably go see that movie. Because my mom is like super Christian. Mm-hmm. Like super Christian right now. And I was I just like, uh, okay, uh, I'll, I'll think about it. Bye. It's not too, it's not very preachy with its message. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing I did enjoy about it. And it got to me, though. I mean, I, I cried like a bitch during some of the parts. Wow. But it just, hey, I'm, I'm more sensitive. I will admit that I'm a sensitive type of guy. But, very fragile. But kind of here's person. the thing the guy they got to be the, um, the guy they got to be the basically the dad who was like, he it, he had a history of beating the you know he had, he basically beat his kid and that's the whole thing and the whole thing is, is that his dad became a Christian later on in life and you know he's tr- the dad's trying to make amends for it and um, trying to you know. It, it's it just follows the band and that kind of stuff and it's kind of like all we re- the song all we've re- revolves around this whole portion of his life but give me a moment here um yeah michael dugan uh no not michael dugan that's the that's the person who was played he, he plays as ray wise plays the dad I believe Ray Wise or and, oh, when, when this movie you watched, yeah, either that or wait a second, was it because wait, which movie are you talk? Okay. Hold on, let me see what the movie I you're talking about. He's imagine. talking about uh, I can only imagine, which is like a Christian movie, movie. cast. Yeah, the, the guy, the guy who played the dad, Dennis Quaid, plays the uh, dad. Dennis Quaid's in this movie. <laughs> How did you mix Dennis Quaid with Ray Wise? I, I don't know. I really don't know. So what is this about? Uh, did you ever hear the song I Can Only Imagine? No, I have not. It's okay. a fucking Christian song. It's a well. Christian song, basically. It's The whole idea is that um, this is talking about how this song came about. And the lead band member of uh, Mercy Me, Bart Millard, he, growing up, his mom left his dad, and his dad was an abusive you know, parent. He beat him, all that. He played beat him, did that kind of stuff to him. And uh, Bart basically was trying to, you know, trying to find some way to connect to to his dad or, like, make it so that he wouldn't be beat so much. Well, originally, Bart was trying to become a um, a football star. And fortunately, he broke both his legs while being doing doing football practice and couldn't play football anymore. So he, and apparently this is like literally the way that it came about. He was trying to find another elective to take so that he could pass uh, high school since the sports elective wouldn't ever work out anymore. So he went ahead and went into the glee club. (laughs) He had no history of singing, no history of doing anything music related besides just, you know, listening to music tapes. And one day he was just running the electrical stuff up in the up in the uh, bleachers and stuff, getting everything ready for the school play. And he just starts belting along with one of the songs he was uh, that was playing, one of the rock songs, and uh, that's how he got first lead in one of the first school plays. Uh, led to basically him continuing on, joining up with a band, Mercy Me, and. The whole thing is they're trying to figure out how to become like, you know, get a record deal, 
get all that stuff. And everyone in the record is basically saying like, yeah, you got, you're there, but you're not going to be getting here. You don't, don't have your heart into it. There's something going on in your life that you got to deal with. And he goes back to his d- dad to try to deal with them. It first starts horribly, you know, like they just keep on fighting, doing that stuff. And he's trying to leave and, uh, you know, get away from the guy. Uh, for some reason, his motorcycle won't start. So he decides to go take steal his dad's truck in order to get out of there. And while trying to find the keys to his dad's truck, he finds out that his dad has cancer. Uh, I think it was like pancreatic cancer. He's dying. And so he basically decides, you know what? God, if God can forgive you, I can forgive you. And he starts, you know, working with his dad. And he starts actually becoming best friends with his dad. And he's like, you know, the dad I always wanted is now going to basically die on me. This is this is so you know, this is stupid and that kind of stuff. But after, you know, the funeral happened and his dad basically took out his life insurance policy and said, Hey, I want you to continue doing this. I want you to continue following your dream. I think that you have something here. And I'm sorry that I basically told you, you know, dreams are stupid. Don't follow them because you just end up here. And he decides to write the song. I can only imagine based on what his grandmother said in that uh, he, his grandmother basically told him, I can only imagine what your father's seeing right now. And that's how it basically came about. He did I Can Only Imagine. Originally, it was going to be a song for Amy Grant, who was, um, I think, Amy Grant. I think it's Amy Grant. Yeah. Amy Grant, uh, another Christian singer, was originally going to use the song as a comeback. But whenever it came time for her to like premiere the song, she just couldn't put, she couldn't bring herself to do it, and instead had the orig- the singer Bart come up and perform. I can only imagine, and the rest is history. Basically, it's like one of the tar- It's like the number one single during the year that it came out. And he's had, and the band's had 21 number one singles since then. But that song was like, it doesn't matter where you were in like 1990s, in like 19, like 2000, or like the, in the 2000s, or the 1999. It was everywhere. You would hear it on secular radio. You would hear it on Christian radio. It didn't matter. Mm. It's a good, it's a good movie, basically because it doesn't show. You know, it's. It's not trying to take any side, and it's not trying to preach to you either. It's just it's trying just to tell a story, you, I guess. Then it's yeah, it's telling the story of how I can only imagine came about. Mm. That's a really sad story. Hmm. Yeah. Also, and, I found out that film I was thinking about when I was talking about Get Out. Uh, yeah. Because it's basically I don't know if you ever remember an old movie called The Stepford Wives. Oh yeah, The Stepford Wives. That's yeah. not really anything like Get Out. Sorry. That's not the Stepford Wives is about reprogramming your wife so that she acts like a robot. No, it's not reprogramming. It's literally like replacing them. Yeah, but this one is kind of like they're not replacing the black person; they're just taking over the black person. Uh, oh, whenever grown, something, it was kind of a mix between that, like I the aesthetic agree. of like the fake town, as well mm-hmm. as something like Evasion of the Body Snatchers, almost. I yeah, I think there's an even more. There's another movie that is basically apes on even more than Stepford Wives, but I can't remember it. Oh, so man. this is a great. Uh, so as you can tell, this is a very good movie podcast. Half of us don't know what what the hell we're talking about half the time. I just tried to remember. Yep, we can't remember what movies we watched. Oh god, yeah. well, those are the only ones that I've watched was Death Wish and then Blade. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I also went and watched I also went and watched a game night because I was half expecting to be bored by um, you know, uh I can only imagine. But it was very that one was very good. I'd recommend people going to see it, but um uh, Game Night was also another good one. It's a comedy. Uh have you either of you watched it? No. Uh it has an interesting premise. It stars one of the people who uh, was uh, the 
uh, he was in Horrible Bosses. He was the one who, uh, did you guys watch Horrible Bosses at all? I've only seen snippets. It was pretty bad. I dropped it like maybe oh. half an hour in. Okay. Well, this whole movie is revolving around these. Uh, it sets the whole thing up. This one guy who is like so. It's basically two people uh, of couple, husband and wife, who originally were like rivals during like game nights at the pub. And then they just decided to combine their forces and they became like the power couple for game night. And that's a whole movie just revolves around like these couples getting together for game night. But then the rich asshole brother comes and he decides that he's going to host game night himself. But they are going to do a murder mystery type thing where somebody gets taken and stuff. But then the brother gets taken for real. And so it becomes... and. I was half afraid there was going to be like, oh, they think it's a game all the way through. No, it's like a uh, quarter of the way in, they just drop all pretense of it being a game. They know that it's been a kidnapping, but they're going to try to get the you know brother back because they you know they're all friends and that kind of stuff. And it gets really interesting in the movie. I. I <sighs> I can't really explain it. Like, I'm trying to remember. So I guess it's not that memorable. I did enjoy it. But one thing I really liked is that whenever they were, like, going into the scene, everything kind of looks board game-ish. It's like, it doesn't look real. They have a lot of shots where they're very, very far away. And everything looks like kind of a plasticky fake look to it. That actually gets paid off further in the movie why that is happening but it has it was an interesting movie in that it wasn't that gory it wasn't like gross out it actually had decent jokes in it like the one the brother gets shot by accidentally by his wife whenever she drops the gun that the other brother had and he gets a bullet wound into his arm so they're trying to figure out you know like they can't go to the doctor to remove the bullet because that would get his brother in trouble because his brother just said, hey, I'm actually a smuggler. I've been selling stuff on the black market. You can't get the cops involved or they'll nail me. And so they decide to go to a – they decide to go to a um, a mini mart and pick up everything that they need to get in order to extract the bullet. So the wife's there. He's like, I pulled up I pulled up how to extract a bullet from this like – uh, Ku Klux Klan website. I'm just going to avoid all the racist shit and just go into like how to actually remove a bullet. And she goes and prepares everything. Does you know cuts starts cutting him open. You know, using alcohol to uh, disinfect stuff. And they try go take the tweezers to try to remove the bullet. She starts tapping on something. Is like, oh wait, that's bone. That's not a bullet. Okay, I got to figure out how to get this. And the guy's just looking at his arm, and then he turns it around, and there's an exit wound. So basically, there was no bullet to extract. Just, <laughs> it was just so stupid, but, oh That boy. sounds like a pretty funny joke, though, for someone who doesn't know mm-hmm. what they're doing. Yep, exactly. They, then, like, you know, like, they have the whole, oh, if you're going to... Th- you know, the guy starts trying going to throw up because he's looking at the exit room. He's like, no, honey, don't do that. If you start doing that, I'm... Bleh. And it's like... And you just see a scene of them basically cut, cutting off where they're both, like, about to throw up, but you don't actually see the throw up. It, for being a... There's only one gory part in the whole movie, and it comes at the end. Um, they... Stuff happens, and... Uh, they're trying to save the brother off a jet plane. One of the henchmen has one of the main characters uh, stu- like at gunpoint near the entrance to the plane. And they're trying to, you know, and it's going to basically shoot the person dead. Well, the fight happening inside goes all the way to the cockpit. And then they bump into the thruster, the thruster control. And so the engine suddenly just revs up to max and you see the henchmen fly backwards and you just see this like blood smear coming out the back of the engine. And the 
and the person's like, yes! Oh, crap, he died. He, it was an interesting movie. I liked it. I personally thought it was very good, and it uh, it completes everything. It's... I don't want to say anything because I do want, I do recommend this movie to people and I don't want to spoil it because it has it does the stupid you know like what a twist thing but it does it very well. What a twist. Mhm. Yeah, speaking of which, I'm still waiting to see what's going to happen with that sequel to Split. That's Split. that should be a movie we talk about one day too. Split was pretty fun. Uh, remind me, what split? Uh, it was the one with James McAvoy and Anna Taylor Joy about the guy who had like twenty three <laughs> different personalities and like abducts these girls in a basement. Oh, oh, I I never see that. <laughs> oh, it's really good. I would I would. It's, the only movie I ever saw Night that Shyamalan. had the only movie I ever saw that had multiple personalities was Me Myself and Irene. Oh. I would definitely recommend it because it's actually a pretty decent uh, thrower. Decent thrower, especially ah. especially if you've actually watched like M- like which have you watched any M Night Shyamalan movies? Yeah, I've seen a couple of them. I've seen um, I've watched basically the fifth the fifth uh, the sixth sense. Yeah. Uh, Signs, which I actually enjoyed. Signs. Signs is pretty I've- good. Yeah. I, ex- I one thing I liked about Signs is the ending. It's basically a rip off of the original um, uh, of like a. I think they ripped off an Adventures and Odyssey episode to tell the truth that was ripping off in the, um, which was also ripping off a, a the whole radio show where they did War of the Worlds over like and people thought it was real. Hmm. Because in this radio show called Adventures in Odyssey, they had like an episode where they these people were babysitting these kids, and they didn't know what was happening. They just turned on the radio to listen to some music, and then they decided to do this radio play. And they think that you know stuff is happening, and so they go out to try to save the mom. And after they go out, the the recorder comes up. And it's like, okay, thanks to a lot of people being upset. We want to remind you, this is just a dramatization. There's nothing going on. And the whole idea is that the way that they defeated the aliens and the dramatization is that plain water is toxic to them. Hmm. And then I see this movie. I'm like, huh? Hey, Cron, are you still talking? I'm done. Yeah. Have you seen Unbreakable? Yeah, I did see Unbreakable. That okay, was most then, yeah, good then too. definitely then definitely watch Split. Okay. Just 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 watch it and then come back to me and tell me what happens out at the end. Wait, okay. Oh, uh, you're do talking that. about what was Don't it Split? Don't say it, Jeff. No, I I mean the movie Where? Split, right? Yeah, the movie. Yeah. Not the one with like the alien thing, but the one with James McAvoy. Okay. Yeah, I I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm just so wondering what's going to happen with because there's going to be think, a sequel for that and that's going to be... I think to tell the truth I think the podcast is basically over. We're into just discussing each other with stuff we like. Okay, yeah. Well, it's Okay, then we'll end it here. Thank you for watching. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This was Blade plus things. Yeah. Do you want to do Demolition Man for next week? Or nah, next two I don't weeks? Do de- we'll, we'll figure it out. Don't worry. Okay. Let's, we'll figure that out. You'll all have to wonder what we're going to do next week, so stay tuned.